I've spared you watching me pull this out of the box, but just grabbing under here and lifting, there is uh, bubble wrap around there and then plastic wrap around the whole thing. And this is an enclosed printer, but obviously we're lacking some walls. So there's a little bit of assembly required. We've got this box of, looks like filament and parts. And then we'll just pull these two pieces out and throw them away. Got that audio. And you'll notice that we have some zip ties here on the hot end. So there's zip ties kind of holding this, this uh, cardboard on there, but it's also restricting the movement um, in the X and Y directions so that this thing stays perfectly stationary during transport. So we're gonna take flush cutters and cut these. And I'm curious if we maybe have some cutters in here. So we have what looks like a kilogram of matte PLA. Uh, it says it has a temperature range of 190 to 230. So that's quite the broad range. Um, and kind of neat there, it's got little gram markers on there to give you an idea of how many grams worth of filament you have left on the spool. We have the screen, and this is obviously going to attach up here. There's the power cable. And then we have some Bowden tube, which this is a direct drive hot end, so it's really just guiding the filament from the outside of the machine to the, to the hot end there. Um, so I guess we have the spare one. And then individually taped <laughs> uh, Allen keys, really long one actually. So here we have the hot end assembly. It says 0.4 bamboo lab. So it's obviously the cold side that the fan blows by to stop the heat creep. And then we have this, which is likely the heater block, really, really tiny. Uh, and then the, the nozzle right there. So this is like an integrated nozzle and heater block unit. A couple little spare rollers, it looks like. A PTFE tube anchor. So this is likely what's going to bolt on uh, on the outside of the machine that the PTFE then leads inside from there. We have our spool holder bracket. We have lubricant grease. This says four hot end. There's two screws and a little bracket. A couple screws for the spool holder. For DIY shell. I believe they're referring to the panels for the extruder. And these ones have uh, a little bit of uh, Loctite on the threads, red Loctite. And then a 3D printer safety and usage guidelines little booklet. And of course on the top of the printer, I think I forgot to mention was the instruction manual. So I read the manual and it has the assembly instructions. Those little things I said were like rollers or something here, these are actually for the little purge box or the overflow box or overflow chute as I think they call it. Um, so uh, they're, not, they're not guides or rollers. <laughs> anyway, um, so we've removed the uh, straps, we've removed the cardboard from here. The next step here says to install the spool holder and the PTFE tube anchor assembly. That's obviously on the back of the printer. So on the back of the printer here, it says spool holder and it's got arrows to these two screw holes. Only this one has a screw in it. Um, but there's another green label on this bag that says for the spool holder and there's two longer screws in here. So we're gonna use these. They're longer, you know, to account for the thickness of this bracket. So we're gonna use these to attach the spool holder to there. One side of it has this little bump out here. And so that's gonna go into the recessed hole that is currently hiding the screw head there, okay? So up in the same corner of the back here, we have the PTFE anchor next. This bag contains both the screws and the anchor bracket itself. And it is going to go into those two holes there. And we want the PTFE facing down. You'll notice it's kind of hanging a little crooked. So those two screws had kind of standoffs built into them so that you can't over tighten them. So no matter how tight you tighten them, this will always be loose and that's by design. On the subject of tightening them, this screw on the right was a little tight. Like it was hard to kind of get it threaded. Um, and no, it wasn't cross threaded. I backed it out until the threads caught. Um, but it's almost like the threads weren't fully cut through or maybe cleaned out. Uh, regardless, you're kind of just gonna self tap it in there. Um, but in doing so, it's best to not use the rounded end of an Allen wrench like this. If you do have a rounded one, use the flat one because it gets kind of like a more full bite on the, on the, uh, on the bolt itself. Because you don't want to round this out or the bolt, especially when they're kind of unique like these ones. But like I said, it's by design that you can't over tighten this. And why might that be? 
Well, as your spool is you know, full, it's you know, big, it's large, so the angle in which the filament will be coming off of it kind of corresponds to that. And as it gets uh, near the end, it's coming off very close to the center of the spool. And so the angle would be more like that. So this kind of allows this to just float and follow the natural angle and kind of curve of the filament as it comes off the roll. Okay, next step is we're gonna connect the PTFE tube here. So it is kind of clipped onto the wire that goes to the hot end. So this side here, make sure it's fully inserted into the coupler there, give it a tug. So then on the hot end side, we're just gonna put it right in here until it clicks and then it's nice and secure. So let's turn the printer back around here. And you'll notice that we still have styrofoam underneath the, the heated bed here, the build plate. Um, there's three screws that have to be removed to kind of unlock the build plate. It's locked for shipping. So they've got little stickers, little orange stickers here, one, two, and three. So those need to be removed. At this point, I should also have already removed the styrofoam from the little chute here with the roller I mentioned earlier. So those three screws are kind of like self-tapping screws and they're, they're screwed right into plastic. So it will take a little bit of grunt work to get them out. Um, but now that has freed the bed. And then we're now going to install the screen onto the front here. So let's remove the tape. This cable is keyed, so it only goes in one way. And then there's little notches on these, so it's gonna go in and then slide to the side. Just route the cable kind of in the void in the back and then slide it like that, there we go. So that's it for assembly. Uh, so it did not come with panels. The panels are purchased separately, um, or you can make your own panels um, out of like aluminum composite material or something like that if you'd like. Um, but I know that they offer a selection on the site as well. Um, so that's it. We still haven't removed this because we're going to power up the printer, connect to it, I think via the app, and then we'll be able to raise the bed. So I've downloaded the Bamboo Handy app on my phone and I've created an account. In my case, I linked it to my Google account, so that was pretty straightforward. Uh, and then it says I have no devices. So at this point, the instructions tell us to turn on the printer and there should be a QR code here to tie this machine to our Bamboo account. Um, on the bottom of that page of the instructions, it actually specifically tells you to not remove these because it's gonna go through a calibration process and at the end of the calibration process, that's when those get removed. So before use, please make sure that you've read the user manual. I have, and I'm now at this stage, so I'll hit next. Before use, please make sure you remove the screw fixed the hot bed. Yep, those are the three retaining screws that we removed from the bottom. We are in North America. Scan the code. So I'm going to hit plus on the app and scan. So now it's going to tie that particular printer serial number to my account. We have to choose our Wi-Fi network. So I'll agree to the terms and conditions and then it's gonna tie this serial number to my account. I'll hit confirm to bind. And then it's gonna ask us which Wi-Fi network we wanna to connect to. I'm gonna choose in my case printer Wi-Fi and enter my password. There we go. So now the screen here has changed and on the on the phone, it says, please confirm you remove the three screws to unlock the hotbed, which we've done. So I'm hitting confirm. And right away, we can see that an important update is detected and needs to be run before printing can continue. So we are going to update now. And we can see the firmware is just about done. It's only taken maybe two or three minutes. and we saw this flicker, looks like it restarted. So make sure that we've read the user manual, so it's just reminding us these things. We've removed the screws. Oh, next. We'll re-choose our location. And then, yep, we're gonna do the self-test. And on the screen, on the phone, you can actually see the temperature of the hotbed, um, the speed, and the temperature of the, uh, of the hot end as well and that the device is idle. And at the top, you'll see like the device's uh, unique ID or, or serial number or what have you. So let's hit start. While this is going, I'll just point out these two rails across the X here. So that whole assembly moves forward and back. So you wanna keep that as lightweight as possible. And it seems like these might be carbon, carbon fiber tubes. 
um, and not stainless steel or steel like these ones here. These ones are stationary, so there's no moving mass there, so the, their weight doesn't really matter. Uh, <laughs> and now it's moving up and down rapidly. Yeah, both of these, they're not cold like metal would be, and they have like that matte kind of charcoal finish on them. I'm obviously just making assumptions here. I don't know if you can hear that, but there's a lot of vibrations, and you can actually hear it changing frequencies. So it's changing the... <laughs> it's, now it's getting loud, of course, as I start talking. So you heard there it got pretty loud for a while and changed kind of tone uh, of the vibration. So it was changing the frequency at which it vibrated back and forth. If I had to guess, um, it's checking the resonant frequencies of this printer on this particular surface. Um, to compensate for that using Clipper's input shaper um, to reduce resonant frequencies in your print. So it will try to avoid the frequencies at which the machine shakes the most so that those shaking vibrations don't translate into your print. Okay, our printer is finally ready. That took about oh, five minutes or so. And the firmware has been updated, that's good. We could rerun the calibration if we needed to. It will sleep after 15 minutes or reset it. And there's our serial number. Let's get out of here. So there's the speed, bed temperature, nozzle temperature. If we go over, we can, we can change those. I'm selecting them on the screen there. So I could set the hot end to be 110 or something. So if we hit up, we're going up in 10 increments down 10 increments and then right in one, left in negative one, right? So a bit of a different interface. And so the moment I selected 140 degrees, we hear the hot end fan turn on. The hot end fan is actually the one in the side. It's definitely not this front one, but I heard it go on somewhere. I have no idea where it is, but it's somewhere inside this casing here. Uh, this front one would be the part cooling fan. So the hot end fan is on. It's only at 140 degrees, not a big deal. Uh, get out of this menu. What other options do we have? So it looks like we have the extruder up or down. So it's extruding or retracting. Um, it's actually interesting that it allowed me to do that at such a low temperature, because if I did have material in here, the gears are just gonna grind against the filament uh, at 140 degrees. So it's not gonna be able to move it either direction. Uh, go back, and then moving the bed up and down. And if we hold it, it'll just move in, looks like two or so millimeter increments. So when I hit home, it did that bed jiggly thing like it did with the calibration routine. It homed the X and Y to the front corner here and then brought it to the center and then brought the bed up, but beforehand it jiggled it up and down. And then it looked almost like it was sensing with the nozzle as it tapped the bed to zero that out. Um, I half expected it to go back to the, to the little um, kind of filament overflow chute here um, to park itself. So we do have an unload you know, for unloading filament um, essentially retracting a bunch all at once. And we have a folder icon which has some files. So those files are in the SD card right up here in the top frame. Um, it was pre-inserted from the factory. And so we've got like a spool part, spool part two, bed scraper, uh, and a puzzle. All right, well, I'm gonna print each of these off camera. And so then back at the home here, it's just kind of your standard status screen. Um, you've got our Wi-Fi kind of signal strength there. Um, the nozzle temperature, again, I did heat it up a little bit. Uh, so I should probably cool that guy off. Let's go down and I'll just turn this all the way to the bottom. So I will print all of those pre-sliced files, but in addition, we're gonna take a look at the software that comes with the Bamboo printer, their own slicing software, and we'll do our own custom slices. All right, so I've installed uh, Bamboo Studio, and uh, we're gonna set it up. So we are in North America. 
will allow the anonymous data. And which printer do we have? So we have the P1P and it has a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. So that's the only one we need. It's kind of cool that you can use it for your boron as well. So I'll be giving that a try maybe. Let's hit next. And uh, we'll have all the different filament types, that's fine. No, nope, we'll just leave the defaults here. Yeah, we're gonna want this, so let's install the plugin. And now if I go device, there we go, we see the device ID. No camera connected. We've got an SD card. What settings do we have here? No settings, that's fine. So if I home it, you're just gonna have to trust me that the printer is now homing. Oh, the window is a little bit too small. Let's just maximize this. Here we go. So under media, not supported by this model of printer. Okay. Update, I recently did a uh, firmware update on the uh, screen on the printer, so that's good. And maybe I can, let's prepare something for printing. Yeah, that resembles my build plate. Okay, so let's uh, import a file. Well, we're using Bamboo's PLA, so that makes this easy. We've got a preset for it. Um, we could obviously add in a, a custom filament as well. We're gonna do 0.2 millimeter, that's fine. Layer height is 0.2, first layer is 0.2. So seam position aligned, so this is similar to what you'd see in Cure and other slicers. So each layer will have that seam and they'll be all lined up. Uh, only one wall on the top surfaces. Okay, so we've got typically a couple walls all the way around and then the top one is just gonna only have one, one perimeter. Strength, wall loops. Yeah, there's the two for every layer other than the top. Uh, monotonic, so um, infill contiguously from one side to the other. Three top layers, it's kind of low, I like it more like five or six. Um, four bottom layers maybe five to make it one millimeter thick. And you can independently control the true bottom bottom layers as opposed to bottoms which can occur in the middle of a print. So these would be bed layers, so make it make it one millimeter thick on the, on the very bed layers, which is equivalent to five in this case, but you could have a different. 15% uh, infill and grit, that's fine. Now, of course, we can go advanced and expose all kinds of other settings, including the direction of the infill. So typical is kind of on 45 degree angles, but um, it's neat to be able to change that. What other infill options do we have? This is kind of cool that it shows you a visual representation of what those look like. And yes, I'm boring. I'm just going to print a Benchy. Uh, it's nothing to do here, no supports needed or anything. Uh, I'll talk about supports in a little bit. Some of the prints on the SD card came with pretty cool um, kind of tree support structures. Speed, how fast are we printing? 50 millimeters for the first layer and 100, 105. Uh, and then outer walls, 200. Inner walls, 300. Yeah, these are crazy, crazy fast printers. Um, and yes, we do want to slow down for overhang because they definitely print much better when they're slower, especially if we're talking about 200 and 300 millimeters a second. You know what, we're going to leave all this at uh, basically the defaults, 480 millimeters a second travel speed. And well, that, that explains why it kind of looks like it's going in fast motion, you know, fast forward when I videotaped it um, as it was printing some of the test files. Okay, well, let's hit splice seems that it has large overhangs. Please enable support generation. No, trust me, it's okay. You know, you're not wrong. It does have an overhang on the underside of the roof there, uh, but we know that that'll print just fine. And here's some details around how long each component of the print is taking. So this will tell you, you know, where you can cut down time. Uh, if you had maybe 100% infill and infill was internal uh, solid infill was taking, you know, 70% of the print or something, you could maybe not make it solid. Um, but for this, we're just going to hit print. And what are our options here? Print plate, print all, send, send all. Hmm. I'm going to have to refer to the manual, I think. 
um, but print plate is the default, so I'll just hit print plate. It's gonna print this, 48 minutes. That seems like a long time, but we'll see. Um, the printer, I only have one printer, so yes, and yes do bed leveling. We'll hit send. That's kind of cool, so it jumps right to the device screen. So now it's doing the bed leveling process, and we can see also the, um, the progress meter here is kind of stuck at 10%. On the screen on the printer, you would see it unzipping the 3MF that it sent over the cloud to the printer, um, and then it's printing the file within there. Um, and it still says about 48 minutes, but I don't believe that. Um, I did notice, I just went and checked that uh, I never installed the camera. The camera came in a separate box and there's not instructions in the main manual for where to install that. So I definitely need to look at the instructions and install that, but I don't want to do that when, when the printer is printing. Um, and then we'll use my phone to take a look at what the camera feed looks like. Up here, we can see, of course, the nozzle temperature. So it's set to 140 degrees as it's doing its bed leveling. And the bed's currently about 36 degrees or so. Um, lamp as well didn't seem to make any difference on the printer, including uh, turning it on and off on the uh, screen on the printer directly. Okay, so the camera itself slides in the uh, front corner here by the screen, slides from the back towards the front, and it kind of latches onto the bottom rail here, and uh, there's a little piece that goes through the front rail. Um, so once that's in there, you route the flat cable, it's like got sticky tape on the back side, you route it up the side here over top, and then you peel this stuff off the back of the screen and it slides into a little ribbon cable slot in the back there and then just place that back over top. Okay, so we're back and uh, I've printed some of the example files that were on the SD card. There were a bunch of files that said things like scraper and stuff and I'm like, I don't really wanna print a scraper but I chose some with unique names. Um, I don't even know what the names of these each were, but these three guys printed you know, flat like this. These are like cell phone stands of sorts and it's a printed in place kind of hinge. So I'm just like breaking it for the first time, but it's like a hinged, couple hinged joints like that. And then you've got a stand kind of thing. Um, kind of looks similar to the tablet stand my daughter has on her, uh, on her tablet cover or case. And then just a smaller iteration of the same thing. Uh, but that's kind of cool. Pretty, pretty nice actual hinge effect. Uh, and they printed amazing. Um, this printed ridiculously fast as well as you'll see from some of the footage somewhere here. Um, it looks like it's in fast motion. One of the other files was called a puzzle. And I think this ends up assembling into a, a cube of sorts. So they're all you know, printed flat. I think there's like six pieces, something like that. Um, I have not yet put it together, uh, but it uh, printed absolutely beautifully. Like I was kind of surprised because I thought the, how, how jerky it was and fast, I figured there's gonna be some sort of defect, like they're really pushing the limits. The whole machine is also like, you can see it vibrating with your, your eyes. Never mind the table, you know, shaking underneath it. And none of that reverberation surprisingly translated into the print itself, uh, except for whatever happened with this one. So this is a hexagon container or, or storage something, I forget what it was called, um, but this, printed amazing and fast. Um, nice, smooth, perfect extrusion, you know, nothing to complain about at all. But in some lights, and I'm not sure how the camera's gonna pick it up, you can see almost a, a wavy banding effect. That's probably maybe five millimeter, seven millimeter ripples almost. You can't quite feel them with your finger. And even when you look down the side, it's like perfectly buttery smooth. But in the right light, you can see them and like you can almost convince yourself that you can feel them, but you really can't. I don't know what that is, but um, I only noticed it on this print and it's on both this wall and this wall. It's not really on this side. Um, again, I don't know what to conclude from that, uh, but I may try to print this again. And all of these were printed with the matte PLA that it came with. Um, on the file names, it actually says, you know, underscore PLA on each of them. Um, so I would assume that the, their filament will print perfectly with the settings they used. And then this guy. So what is this? Uh, I don't actually know myself. It looks like some sort of a warrior thing, but there's all this uh, 
all the support material around it. So this is kind of a variation of you know, what Kira would have called tree supports. Um, and I'm not sure how they refer to them in their slicer, but instead of the supports being directly underneath the piece they're supporting, they kind of like branch in from the sides. And in this case, they come off reasonably well considering how much material is being supported here. And they're very like light and wispy, so it's not using a lot of material to build out the supports. Oh no, did I just break his hand? I broke his hand. So I've taken all the support material off and though it looks like a lot, it's like, you know, one wall thick, you know, if that, like very, very thin walls. Um, and I'm left with this guy. Now in pulling off the support material, his hand did get damaged. It almost ripped his hand clean off. Um, and there's a bit of support material uh, under his like legs here and a little hole here to kind of access it, but I'm gonna need to kind of chip away at that to get that off. The rest I took off without any tools, just my bare hands. Um, so I'll have to kind of undangle in there with a small screwdriver or pick or something to break that free and into pieces to get it out. Um, but considering how much support material was there, um, both on his hand and under his chin and everything, it turned out really well. However, um, obviously, you know, this bit being just far too thin, um, there's also a weird, it almost looks like a layer shift on where his uh, pants meet his shirt, like kind of at that waistline. Um, but it's not because a layer shift would have translated through to like the back and the back is all perfectly fine. So I'm not sure what that is, but it looks like a, a defect of sorts unless the original model looked like that. There's a little bit of gapping right at the front of the waistline as well. Um, but ignoring that, it turned out fine. And again, this was printed at crazy speed like the rest of the items were. So what do I like about it? Well, I like the calibration routine that you just kind of say calibrate and it goes and does this whole routine. You don't really even have to understand what it's doing. Um, so that's nice. I also like the use of this, use of this kind of purge bucket, uh, which deals with like having oozy stringy bits coming off the hot end. Um, it's kind of uh, a little alarming at first as it kind of runs over this little PTFE bumper here. Um, I thought it was kind of strange that that bucket just kind of drains out the back of the printer. Um, so if there are any little pieces, it's just landing on the back of the desk. And so if I have this on a desk against a wall, for example, I'm not, you know, having easy access behind the machine. Um, same thing with like the spool holder. You're gonna need to leave, you know, six inches behind the edge of the spool holder between the wall and the machine so that you can get another spool back there. Um, having it at the side might have been a little bit easier to access at least, and then you wouldn't have to leave as much clearance at the back. Um, and honestly, you know, there might be some way to move that to the side. Um, but I'm being picky, right? Uh, what I thought was kind of impressive or even shocking is how stuck this build plate is to the bed. Like the magnet that they have in here has such strong magnetism towards this sheet that it grabs it with a vengeance. Um, it's also cool that that sheet, unlike most of them, has kind of a, a I don't know what to call it, like a linen texture to it. Uh, and some of those sheets can kind of be grippy so that you can't, you know, kind of slide stuff along them. They're almost like a vinyl or butyl kind of material. This seems a little bit more durable. Um, and this PEI, you know, uh, build sheet, as you know, I, I love those textured PEI sheets. It's amazing. Um, it worked great. Uh, I even tested the, um, <laughs> inadvertently, kind of tested the uh, print resume and it worked exactly as expected. Plug the machine back in and it basically has a resume button on there. It heats up and begins printing where you left off. Of course, when the power is off, you can't be, you know, carrying this around uh, you know, if the bed gets bumped at all or at, anything's out of place from where it left off, uh, it might not work so well. Um, but that's not the intended purpose, right? If we lose power and the machine's just sitting there and it regains power, we can hit play and, and away it goes. I was kind of shocked to see how low the frame rate was on the camera. Um, I have a Raspberry Pi cam in my printer and it, I mean, while it doesn't have a frame rate to write home about, uh, it's considerably faster than that. I'm not sure what's going on there. I was also really surprised that even though while this thing is printing in fast motion, you, uh, you know, you see everything kind of vibrating, but none of that is translated to the print. And I don't know what kind of sorcery that is. 
Uh, it's an extremely rigid frame, even though it's like light. Um, you know, comparing this to like a Ender 5 S1 or something, the Ender 5 is heavier than this guy is. Um, but you know, this kind of bent, bent uh, frame, this bent, uh, I don't know if it's a loom or steel plate frame, is like extremely rigid in nature and it's kind of all riveted and bolted together. Um, so that's, that's kind of neat. Um, clearly a very capable printer at ridiculous speeds. That said, a few things I was surprised about is number one, that it didn't come by default with panels. Uh, now I know that shouldn't be a surprise. I didn't order the printer. You know, if you're on their site and you're ordering it, it's probably clear to you that it didn't come with panels. It's just everything about it looks unfinished without the panels. Um, if I'm not gonna have panels on it, I'd, I wouldn't necessarily want these little holes and kind of this appearance necessarily. Granted, I'm just being, you know, superficial at this point. Um, but I, you know, I would expect to see panels or kind of a more finished appearance. Um, and, you know, while the accessories also, I don't believe come with it, there's a light bar. Um, our light bar kit didn't come with the diffuse housing that they show on the video instructions on their site. So the diffuse housing, the light bar is inside that, and then that gets kind of 3M taped into the frame. We just have LEDs on a, on a circuit board. Um, there didn't seem to be the diffuse housing in the box, uh, unless it got lost, so don't quote me on that. It also came with this aux fan in the accessories kit. And in looking up what this is and how to install it, I actually just came across the fact that you can print the LED light bar shroud I don't know how you print the diffuse housing portion of it because that's likely not to turn out great in PLA or anything, um, but you can apparently print that housing, so maybe we'll get to printing that. Um, I kind of expect it to be included. But similar to this, um, this is the auxiliary fan, and it's intended to go here, and it blows across the bed here. So what it's doing is it's providing additional cool air to the print area, just helping you with cool your print, right? Um, you can also print significantly faster that way because you're getting overall print cooling, not just where the nozzle is, so you can reduce your layer times, right? So um, you don't have to worry about the whole layer cooling before you go to the next layer. If you were printing a, a tall, you know, pencil thick tower out of ABS, let's say, and each layer is only you know, a couple seconds, the next layer is molten on top of the first one and eventually the whole thing is just kind of like a melty mess. So this would allow you, maybe not one second, but it would allow you to decrease the layer time without any negative effects, um, essentially increasing your cooling. I've also saw that there's some people that have converted this into like a Nevermore. Um, Nevermore is something that I use on my Voron where it's uh, activated charcoal filtering the, exhaust, the, the fumes inside the, the cabinet, inside the enclosure. Um, granted, you're gonna have to throw panels on here to get that kind of effect. Um, and there's a bunch of other things to print to make that happen. But to get this installed in its kind of native fashion, you need a bit of a standoff bracket underneath here um, that goes in the bottom here and just kind of, you know, because since this is bolted up there, it kind of takes up that slack on the bottom. Uh, you're gonna have to print that as well. So I'm not gonna install this, um, and I will get either panels made or purchase panels. Uh, if I wanna print ABS or anything like that, I'm gonna want this as enclosed as possible. I'm kinda curious how the top would be enclosed here, but I guess I'll tackle that when the time comes. So in conclusion, it's a very capable machine that can print amazing quality at ridiculous speeds. Uh, granted, I haven't sliced these myself, so I'm kind of curious to see how well I can make it print with my slicing. Um, you know, not that my slicing is what makes it a great print, but just, you know, these are obviously kind of tuned to the max. Um, it's quiet aside from the, the cooling fan, but I mean, you have to move a lot of air in a hurry if you're gonna cool when you're printing at insane speeds. Um, and the software, both the slicer and the phone app, work great. The whole way of connecting it to Wi-Fi is very simple with the QR code. Um, and I kind of look forward to playing with their slicer a little bit and just kind of exploring the features that it has available. Hopefully you found all that useful. Remember, like and subscribe and ring the bell. Get notified when we upload more videos like this. Thanks for watching.